Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, today we are going to continue with our uh, chapters. Our next chapter is encapsulation. Uh, we have to talk about the encapsulation uh, abstraction uh, in the last session. Uh, abstraction is a way of dealing with complexity in programming languages as well as the other uh, disciplines. And uh, so today we are going to bring that into uh, one level uh, further uh, by having uh, encapsulation. Uh, creating um, more complex things out of existing abstractions. And this is basically uh, encapsulation. Uh, so uh, the thing here is uh, when you have uh, abstraction, you can deal with some uh, part of the complexity. Uh, the for example, if you have 50 lines of code in a very simple homework, uh, you don't need abstraction at all, so everything can fit into a main function. But if you go further, like 500 lines, you start using functions. You need to use functions because you need local scopes and abstracting commonly used expressions into functions, commonly used set of statements into uh, the um, comments, uh, the procedures or void functions, if you like. But uh, as you get larger, like thousands lines of code, uh, dealing uh, everything in a, a single um, uh, source code, basically, uh, is impossible. So you edit thousand lines of code in an editor. Uh, if you did this, you will understand how difficult and uh, hard for someone to deal with that sort, sort of complexity. So what you need to do is you need to uh, put uh, relevant things together in small packages and combine those packages. Uh, like you start creating small libraries of your code. Uh, it will also make your compilation easier by using some basic utilities. Uh, if you go further, you need uh, the collections of libraries combined together and you have the heaviest way of abstraction, modularization and all, everything will be uh, designed in uh, some sort of harmony in order to uh, communicate well because uh, as those numbers get larger, that means you are not the on, uh, only one developing the software anymore. There are new people. So, okay, 500 lines, you can deal with them, but as you go thousands, it is hard. So you need to have a team of friends, uh, developers. Uh, so you need to communicate, you need to um, at least uh, Decide on the basics, basic interfaces, conventions, uh, the rules uh, start to bring into the uh, software de development. And it is not programming anymore. It gets uh, software engineering and so on. So this, uh, in order to deal with this efficiency, we need uh, this complexity, we need to start with combining things together, uh, uh, what we call packaging. So if you create an independent set of uh, abstractions together into a body, usually it is a source code or a directory sometimes, uh, we create a package. And in this package is, uh, you can consider a package as a, a collection of declarations, functions, types, and so on. Uh, when you do this, uh, you can deal with some sort of complexity. Uh, but when you are doing so, when you uh, putting all of the declarations in a body, that means you are trying to get rid of some sort of, some part of the uh, complexity in the details. So details are relevant only inside of this package. For outside, they 
are not relevant. So the other applications using this package doesn't have to care about this detail. So this is another form of uh, abstraction. So we abstract some of the declarations from the outer world and we uh, interact with them is by a basic set of declarations that we call interface. So it will be something like that. The other applications cannot access here. And the uh, only uh, way uh, this application uses packages to use this interface definitions. And this is called uh, hiding and encapsulation. Uh, so in this way we will have Uh, not only collection of declarations, but also providing this um, uh, separation of interface from the detail and the code. Uh, so primary uh, concerns are uh, there are high volumes of details. We like to reduce them to the interface definitions. So only the maintainer of the package has to know the details. The others doesn't care, they only use the interface. Uh, we have heavy reuse because of this uh, portability and easy to do, uh, learn interface. We can develop further codes using this package. And this will bring us this modular programming, bringing pieces on top of each other, combining everything to uh, get uh, the code. Uh, and one of the most important thing is, uh, even when the details change, so your package changes, you use a newer protocol, you use a newer library, you use a new uh, algorithm, the using the applications, the user do not change. But there is an important uh, point here, as long as you have the same interface definitions. Sometimes uh, the developers has, uh, have to change their interface and it is really a disaster for uh, many application developers because they had to uh, adapt their code, code, migrate their code into this new interface. Uh, this gives us the importance of the importance of the interface. If you have a well-designed interface, you don't have to change it. Not forever, of course, but for a long period of time. Uh, and your following projects can reuse this model. So everything is uh, going uh, around this ease of development, ease of maintenance, and uh, our primary concern here, starting with abstraction is, code reusability. Okay, so how this is possible? So let us start talking about this. Uh, the packaging is basically putting group of declarations into a single body. Uh, even uh, C language does that. So in order to deal with complexity, you do uh, putting relevant things together in a source code. Okay, so you create a couple of uh, C files, not a couple of, as many C files you like. And each C file uh, contains a, a sequence of declarations uh, that are related to each other. Uh, and by doing so, you have advantages of separate compilation. Uh, you don't have to recompile previously compiled C sources. Uh, and also you can deal with some sort, some part of the complexity when you are looking for something you know where to look at and so on. Uh, and you can replace some of the source codes because some of the definitions in the source code are uh, part of the interface as we call and you can change the others, replace the others. Uh, in C, usual convention, convention is putting everything uh, in the interface part as a header file and the rest in a C file so that 
the other uh, source codes can include the header files so that they will have access to definitions in the interface. Um, that is the uh, primary objective of this dot h dot c uh, extension uh, distinction. In C++, we have uh, namespaces. Uh, so uh, in addition to source code separation, of course, uh, this namespaces give, give us uh, a different scope. So this uh, here uh, in this uh, trigonometry will give us a, a namespace. So all of the definitions remain in this scope of this trigonometry or trick, whatever it is. Uh, so that your uh, global namespace is not polluted. And when you are switching between packages, uh, you uh, name them using this uh, trick so that in all, all your following uh, accesses to this package or namespace, you can use the scope operator so that it will not be confused with any other cosine, pi, and so on. Uh, These double columns are called scope operator and we use uh, in also in uh, classes. Uh, the, um, uh, this will uh, avoid also this identifier uh, overhead uh, you may uh, observe. And the code, but there is no hiding yet. And this one. Uh, with hiding in the game, uh, we have uh, further uh, advantages. As I said, as if you keep the interface same, the details are hidden, so that uh, you can change the details. You can come up with a more efficient version, uh, and so on. In this way your code will be more portable. Uh, and you can have different details for different architectures, for example. All, all of these are uh, part of the possibilities. Uh, this is a Haskell uh, example. In Haskell, we can use separate source codes, of codes as well. And if you use this, Module header at the beginning of a source code, usually at, at the beginning. It will be uh, considered as a module, and the module is nothing but a set of declarations, a package. Uh, but thanks to this definition here, within parentheses, which is optional, by the way, uh, only uh, those names are exported, are visible to the uh, outside world. Uh, the rest, which is, for example, here, I defined a Taylor series expansion or some other expansion in order to calculate those uh, trigonometric functions. Or I am using some random seed here or some error correction algorithm here to give better floating point numbers. They are not visible outside, only pi sine and cosine are part of the interface, so they will be exported. So when you uh, import this module, you are going to observe only three uh, names, and the rest is part of the detail, and they can be ported. And um, C, uh, on the other hand, we have a different uh, approach. So, in C, uh, what you do is you, for example, you go into dot C, all your files here, and what you do is you make your uh, definitions, like a double definition here, cosine definition here. You make such a uh, source code available, uh, it is actually something like a package. But since uh, there is uh, nothing lexical or in part of the uh, compiler in C, however, we can use a linker trick to create 
this uh, not interface functions. It is called static. I use uh, this uh, static keyword here and this uh, two functions, Taylor and Error. They are not uh, exported for Linker. Linker is uh, the part of the compiler that um, combines all of those separately compiled uh, C sources. We compile from .c to .o, then we link them together to the binary. During this stage, those static declared names are not visible. That means they are not part of the interface. So the other functions, other source codes cannot use them. But sine or cosine can use them. So internal to the package, they are uh, valuable and necessary, we can use them, but outside, no. Uh, so this is the case for C. Uh, let us uh, give more example uh, about uh, this Haskell case. Uh, in order to uh, take that, I'm going to give you this example, uh, which is called rational numbers. Uh, so rational numbers are usually two integers. Uh, this is actually a composite value out of uh, two integers, so nothing fancy about them. Uh, we have uh, a simple data definition like data ratio, blah, blah, in order to create them. It is good uh, and nothing wrong with them. Uh, however, uh, we have two basic issues. The first issue is, what about invalid values? So the programmer can create three over zero, which I don't like. So I wish I should do something. So if I use this way, rational number three over zero will be alive in the uh, your code until you convert it into a floating point value, for example. The second uh, problem here is, what about this? One over two, two over four, three over six, 70 over one or 140, they are all the same. So when you are trying to add them, uh, make multiplication, or if you are making some equal to test, what you are going to do? So this is a problem. Uh, so the one, basic thing you can do is uh, we can stop user from using this constructor so that he or she cannot create arbitrary values and take control, write a function for it. The user has to use our function. And uh, this is a typical trick we can use. And we have an example on that. Uh, let me check if I can copy and paste this into shell and show you. Uh, this is This is our uh, code here uh, now. So this code, uh, we have a couple of uh, issues here. Timing, let us not put this uh, interface part. to correct some of the indentation here. 
subtract is here. And this is old. This is not a typical relational algebra implementation. Uh, so uh, now I believe we have a couple of points left. This is also a function. Layout was uh, for the uh, slide, so I corrected it so that we can have a better uh, view of it. Um, so now I'm splitting it. Um, so now I am going to uh, load this. Uh, module. Okay, uh, Prudit has this greater common divisor function, so Okay, so I believe it has loaded. Now I'm going to show you uh, the problem with this. Now if I uh, create a rational value like rational 3, 4, integer non deriving show, so it does write deriving show as well, so that's it's going to show us. Data type. This is a value, and if I multiply this, it's original. I'm going to get this and so on. Okay. Um, now, uh, let us talk about the problem. The problem is this one. Still, I can do this. I can use, sorry, I can use 4 over 0 as uh, some value here. If you don't use this multiply but uh, other uh, values, you will end up in incorrect values. So as long as you give users uh, this um, constructor, uh, the user may uh, end up in some incorrect values. So the first way of getting rid of this is defining the interface. And another thing, another problem. In this implementation, I have used this. I have used, for example, 
9 over 36. Sorry. So this is 3 over 16. As you can see, it's a simplified version. Whatever I take, I always simplify that. So even uh, in any uh, function I wrote uh, is called, I simplify things in the code. I'm going to show it in the code later. But the user is free to define arbitrary values. This is another concern. And division by zero is another concern. And also I have another concern, which is, assume this is a very valuable uh, function that I would like to protect. This is part of my code, so everyone can use it. I don't like this. I, I would like to hide this. So the solution is putting the interface here. Add is in, in my interface. Subtract is in my interface. Multiply is in my interface. Divide is in my interface. And and rat is in my interface. Now I have changed my interface. Uh, now I need to make uh, another trick here. Uh, again, uh, I just uh, paused the recording in order to correct the errors, uh, in order not to lose time. So the first thing we do is we change this uh, name of our function to racial, uh, sorry, source code as racial HS. And I put all of the interface here, including red here. And in another file, which is rat test hs, I make import racial. This is going to look for this racial.hs in the current directory or library search path. So when I load this, it's going to load it. So now let us see what will happen if I can use, for example, my GCD, it is not part of the uh, interface, so it is not loaded. However, add is, so I can add two racial numbers, okay? Type of add will be racial, racial to racial. Uh, similarly, subtract is my interface, multiple. And rat is my interface. For rat, I give two integer values, and it will give you a rational number. If I try to use rat, I cannot, because it is not part of the interface. It is not listed here. And it will make my life better, because now I can do this. Instead of this one, I can write this one. So automatically my values are simplified. And after that, if I have an operation, that is simplified. Okay. Uh, so this is quite convenient. Uh, I hidden all of my details, simplify 
uh, greatest common divisor implementation. And more interestingly, I also hide my data constructor. Instead of that, I have implemented another one, which I can uh, enforce my uh, logic. Now I have a better uh, implementation. User cannot create arbitrary values, thanks to this. Um, by the way, if you uh, load racial directly, uh, you expand the module in the current environment. As a result, uh, you can use the library, so the interface does not work. But if it is indirect, uh, the details are uh, hidden. If you uh, skip this part, everything will be exported as usual. Now let us go back to our example. So this uh, is uh, called uh, the abstract data type. Uh, in the abstract data type, your primary concern is data integrity. And in order to provide data integrity, you enforce your functions to work for your data instead of arbitrary, data, arbitrary values. Uh, uh, the data integrity. Uh, so you um, you basically uh, uh, provide integrity through uh, user subtype constructors and hide the details. And if you combine all of them you end up in uh, what we call the abstract data types. In functional languages like Haskell, you can enforce them with uh, modules. Uh, uh, in imperative languages, mostly we provide abstract data types through uh, objects, which is our next topic. So the object is uh, basically a package that contains uh, hidden variables. The basic definition of an object uh, has uh, the state of uh, the entity is uh, provided by a set of variables and you hide those variables. Instead of using them directly, you uh, enforce data integrity through a set of interface functions. Uh, we, call them methods sometimes, uh, sometimes member functions. But the idea is the same, pretty much the same. These interface functions provide us uh, the data integrity. Changing the variable directly is avoided. Um, the, uh, in this way, we can uh, model all of the entities in our program, in our uh, software, uh, through these objects. Because most of the entities have state and those states can be uh, preserved by or uh, denoted by an object. And what we do is we define their behavior through this uh, integrity preserving uh, set of functions. Uh, so, Uh, I can I can show this uh, better on a programming language that you are familiar uh, familiar uh, which is JavaScript. Uh, the node is uh, JavaScript interpreter that you can install in your machines. The JavaScript is a very simple language. So basically we have these dictionaries anywhere, uh, similar to Python dictionaries. Uh, but they are actually objects, so they, you can create uh, plain objects this way. Now let us uh, try to come up with an object definition, uh, which is a counter. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a counter function and this counter function will create a object like C which is an object uh, with some variables which is C and T which is initially zero and it is going to create an object uh, this object will have two functions increment will be a function incrementing counter by one and returning it and yet will be another function which will return counter so now uh, our function has an object created and it returns this object so a single line function which is the counter so when I call this counter it is going to give me an object like this it is a C++ object and from here I can call C get and each time I call C get I'm going to get zero when I call increment it will give me a new value and when I say C get I'm going to get this four and nice thing is counter is here it is uh, present inside of this function so it's out of the scope so actually in a language like C it shouldn't be alive anymore but it is since it is a script language it is alive garbage collector didn't collect so now I created object I believe a counter which enforces my data in integrity rule only incremented and get not no decremented no arbitrary value can be assigned so now let us have this hypothetical example in C++ assume you have a namespace and in that namespace there is a counter variable and you have the get and increment as it is in our JavaScript example and you can have counter get and counter increment to modify them but the hypothetic part is this one namespace exists in C++ but this hiding definitions do not so uh, in this case I created a counter object and it works this way if C++ allowed me to make this private uh, it would have uh, worked but it is not so uh, because a single object is not much useful you have to declare it every time you need it but if you create a data type out of it you can instantiate it you can create instances of it you can create variables out of it so this counter shouldn't be an object this counter should be a data type and then we switch to classes. In the classes, uh, we create data type for an object. And when we create a new object out of this data type, it is a new instance of it, and it is an object. So this is the relation between class and object. Type and variable, class and object. Um, so this is our uh, legal definition. So each time I uh, call uh, this uh, create a variable out of this counter class I have a new counter and I can increment get and so on um, this is uh, same in our JavaScript example as well each time I call this function counter I create a new instance and I can increment and get values out of it and so on uh, 
So we have uh, this uh, differences between an abstract data type and object. An abstract data type uh, has the same constructor and functions. However, data type definition is hidden and the object variables are hidden. So usually in functional languages, we don't have state variables. So we hide the data type definition. Uh, but in the object, uh, we have the state is the important thing and we uh, hide that. And purpose is the same, preserving data in the integrity, abstraction, so that we could, we could have these entities with a behavior that are implemented and reusable cause, of course. Uh, we have another uh, interesting uh, members uh, for uh, encapsulation, we call it a closure. A closure is an abstraction method and it is like a dual of an object. Uh, the uh, objects are uh, the functions with a state and the closures are like uh, the uh, sorry, uh, the data type with, uh, with functions, sorry, uh, the object is a variable with functions and closure is like a function with variables. Uh, so the thing is actually very similar to our JavaScript example. I encapsulate some of the um, uh, code uh, variable or state in a function body, I sort of hide that inside of the body. Uh, okay. See if I can cut it here. So it is the, I have a function. So let me use the slides. I can't copy paste it, I believe. It doesn't work that way. Uh, so this is in Python 3, uh, perhaps I can uh, write it, memorize it and write that. Okay. So new ID is a function and in that function I have a variable C as initialized to zero and define, I define an increment get function uh, inside of new ID, so it is a nested function. And Python 3 allows me to have this non-local definition about C, and I do increment C by one and return C, and I return increment get as a return of new ID. So now uh, this uh, Python definition will give me a function, which is T. And when I invoke T, call T, it will do this because T is actually increment get. And this increment get increments this uh, non-local C and return it. So each time I invoke it, it is going to increment it and return it, increment, return, increment, return, and so on. And this is an interesting mechanism. So I can, for example, define a U, which is another function. And as you can see, each function behaves differently. They are like functions, but uh, we have this freshly defined C for each 
invocation of new ID so that they have different state inside of those functions. So those functions have some sort of state enclosed in their bodies, encapsulated in their bodies. So we can have different behaviors out of them. Um, and this is a closure and we can use for uh, different purposes as in JavaScript, we can create objects out of it. Also, also it is uh, helpful in code reusability. We can do something very simple, for example, we can have multiple of X can be defined. So then we can define a function, a new function with Y, so that it simply returns X times Y. And return of multiple is actually, return value of multiple is this new function. So this is a new closure for us. And I can define twice as multiple of three and three as multiple of three. Okay, twice should be this way. Okay, now twice and three is R functions. I can have twice of three, this one, or three times of 10. So this is uh, something very uh, similar to uh, curried forms in uh, functional languages. We can use them for uh, reusability. We can create different instances of the same function so that uh, we can have instances of them. Uh, each time we create an instance, we have a different behavior out of them. Okay, so this is the same thing, and this is the uh, counter object implementation in uh, JavaScript. And in uh, C2011, we have closures indirectly, but they are not much uh, useful as it is in the uh, script languages because the lifetime of this inner uh, variable is very important. Garbage collector shouldn't collect it, sorry. If it is a heap variable, garbage collector will uh, make this function refer to the C. As a result, we will all this object refer to the C so it will not collect it so that we will have lifetimes extended. Uh, in C++, we don't have that mechanism, so we have to define it on our own. Uh, I'm leaving this as an exercise because it is not uh, essential part of the uh, course. If you are interested in write this code on your own and try to compile it and observe the behavior and try to find out why. Uh, if you have further questions, I can answer it uh, in the uh, code presently. Uh, so now, uh, in the last slide, uh, we what do we have uh, about further reusability? Further uh, reusability, we can start using object oriented programming with classes, but classes are not sufficient. We have multiple classes, so we should define class relations, classes containing other classes, classes uh, made up out of, made out of other classes, uh, like inheritance, uh, abstract classes, so that we will have interfaces that we can have further uh, derivations and apparently polymorphism, inherent polymorphism. Uh, so these are uh, quite related to object-oriented par paradigm we are going to talk about in the following chapters. Uh, and if you are on the software part, you should consider reading some books and learn some more about design patterns, which are the uh, object-oriented relation uh, designs applicable to uh, different areas. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the end of my talk. Uh, please ask your questions in the uh, discourse. Uh, any uh, question is welcome. Uh, you can ask directly to me, but if you ask in the uh, 
shared platform, everyone will, will see the answer. So that's why I prefer it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, see you soon. Face to face, hopefully. Bye bye.